Welcome to Cinema of Meaning, the podcast that seeks to explore the depths of what cinema has to offer. My name is Tom, you may know me as the creator of Like Stories of Old, and I'm joined by my fellow video essayist Thomas Flight to talk about Andrew Dominic's The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Before we begin, Cinema of Meaning is a Nebula original podcast, meaning that on Nebula you can listen to all of our episodes ad-free and a week early and you'll also get access to a monthly bonus episode. This month, that'll be David Fincher's Fight Club. Be sure to use our personal link in the show notes to get a $20 discount on a yearly subscription. I also want to shout out our Discord server, where we discuss movies with our listeners and take the occasional suggestion. If you want to join our little community, the link for that is also in the show notes. Now, on to the movie with a really long title. Uh, Thomas, really long movie title, which apparently was stipulated in Brad Pitt's uh, contract, that the title of the movie was not to be changed. What was your first experience with this movie? My first experience with this movie was a long time ago, and to be honest, I don't remember it very well. A friend of mine reached out to me recently and said that they had seen that I gave this kind of a low rating on Letterboxd, and they asked me why, because they thought it was a a great movie. And I was trying to think about it and remember why I gave it, I like three, three and a half stars or something. And I couldn't remember. I was like, I don't, I don't, I don't remember why I like didn't love it. And all I could really remember about it was the very iconic cinematography and just kind of the mood of the film. I suggested we rewatch it and I wanted to rewatch it anyway, partially out of curiosity because of that. But also it was it was one that kind of, despite, I guess, not giving it a very high review, those two elements, the cinematography and the mood, kind of stuck in my head. Mm, yeah, yeah. And so it's one I've wanted to revisit. Um, so yeah, very vague past experience with this. And I have to say, rewatching it, whatever, I have no idea what I was thinking the first time I watched it because I absolutely loved it watching it this time. Um, those two elements that I mentioned are extremely strong. This is one of, I think, Deacon's most beautifully shot films, which is saying a lot. The pacing and the dialogue is so fascinating. The, the way the story unfolds is so unexpected, I think. Even having seen it the first time, watching it again, ev- almost every beat that comes next is not the one I expect to follow, but it doesn't feel a lot, not in an illogical or frustrating way, but mm-hmm. it, there's just, just this sequence of never ending tiny surprises in this movie, but not it, also not delivered in a way that's like, ha, we got you. It's just, <laughs> it just slips them sneakily in there yeah, yeah. as if it's the most casual thing ever. It's a it's a very subversive movie, at least within the Western genre. I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's 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 really fascinating as a Western. It almost doesn't feel like one. It feels more in the. I know this was a big influence, but it, it feels very much in the wheelhouse of like a Days of Heaven or hmm. an early Malick or something like that. It's a hard movie to like put a finger on. So anyway, I loved it coming back to it. Yeah. Uh, was it really enjoyed rewatching it, and I'm I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, what about you? What was your first experience, and and how did coming back to it compare? Yeah, I think I also mostly remembered the atmosphere of it because this really is a movie that, especially now watching it again, it just immediately puts you into this mood, I guess. Yes. It starts with these time lapse shots of clouds, and it has this faded faded look to it all and there's the music and the narration and it really just makes you feel like you're not going to watch a story unfolding in real time but rather one that's already happened like it's very it's very aware that it's a story that you're watching something that has already happened in some distant past that we're now observing yeah it's a movie that came out in 2007, and I think I watched it when it came out. I remember because I had to do a report at the time in high school on the American West. I'm not sure what the context of it was, but uh, maybe it was for a history class. But anyways, we had to watch a couple of Western movies, and 
And so I basically watched this movie as a teenager with the attention span of a teenager. <laughs> <Yes>. And yes, <laughs> long story short, I didn't like it at the time. And I told my history teacher and he just looked at me with what I can now imagine must have been a, a feeling of total disgust. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, at the time I also found it kind of hard to follow. I wasn't sure what was actually going on and... I still had that a little bit this time around, where I just wasn't exactly sure about the plot mechanics. Like, at the beginning at least, the first 90 minutes or so, it's a pretty long movie. But I, I struggled to get a sense of all the different interrelations. You know, you obviously have Jesse James, his brother, uh, Robert Ford, and his brother, and the, the kind of tension between them. But then there's also uh, this guy that, uh, also plays Hawkeye, Jeremy Renner's character, there's Ed Miller, Dick Little. There's a bunch of secondary characters that are further removed from the main character. Yeah. And which I kind of struggled to initially puzzle together. The thing is, it might be because of this atmosphere, because it just puts you into this different mode, like a different mode of attention. Yeah. It's one of those movies where after I watched it, I just wanted to walk outside, stand in the field and watch the clouds go by. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't put me in a very analytical mood. and Yeah, it's very contemplative. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, I kind of felt myself zoning out to some extent whenever I watched this movie, but in like a good way, in a way that I really enjoy. But at the same time, that also makes me a bit more fuzzy about yeah. uh, looking back on it and and trying to remember, like, you know, this, this movie was three hours and what happened exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I have a very distinct recollection of some moments, but as for the overall plot, like, I, I wouldn't be able to draw a line from, like, the first act is this, and then the second act was that, and then they moved to this place, and then that happened, and right, it just feels like it's kind of meandering in a way that's purposeful, but... Uh, so this is not necessarily a criticism of the movie, but but it is to say that there are some implications to what kind of engagement you're creating when you have this very contemplative atmosphere that leaves audiences in this kind of trance-like state. It's a movie that requires a very invested viewer, I think, to some extent. You have to be willing to sit with it and also kind of pay attention to to the plot while you're also in this mode of thinking about things and engaging with what the characters are feeling. And I can see why I didn't necessarily connect with it maybe the first time. If you're coming into this going, hey, I like Westerns, and you're thinking like spaghetti Westerns or something like that. And then... Shoot out, or even gunfire. Just any, yeah, any, any old West Westerns. Even something like No Country for Old Men, which is relatively like a deconstruction of kind of the Western mm -hmm. genre basically has like more action. I wouldn't say necessary. Well, th I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's not true. But like it feels more, that movie feels more pulpy. Yeah, th there's definitely more tension there. There's this whole cat and mouse game yeah, that's going yeah. on. This one's kind of, if you're expecting that, you're expecting like Brad Pitt's going to be this kind of badass gunslinger and there's going to be all this crazy stuff happening. You're not really going to get that. Mm -hmm. Instead, you're going to get Brad Pitt kind of looking out a window and being depressed and, you know, all the all these long, flowery sort of pieces of narration about the inner emotional state of the characters and these whole big long scenes where all the tension, all the emotional tension of the scene is kind of predicated on whether or not one character knows the other is lying and you just have to kind of like you're just kind of stewing in the awkwardness of it for like, you know, 10 minutes or something like that. Uh, so there's all these elements that you really have to be wanting to meet the movie kind of in that space. Mm. I can see why myself or a lot of people, you know, wouldn't necessarily be able to engage with that the first time because of expectations or just what you want or whatever. And it did. It's a movie that bombed in the box office. It It, it didn't do very well at all and only has kind of gained traction in hindsight, probably for those reasons. I guess for those reasons, I would say I would encourage people if you saw this a while ago and didn't like it or you haven't seen it because you heard bad things about it, giving it a chance, is, I think, is great. And but knowing what you're 
going to get going in, I think is kind of important yeah, where yeah. like, if you come at this, like you're going to watch like a Terrence Malick movie with some Western elements set in the West, you're going to have a better time than if you're expecting something bigger. And it's cool. It's closest maybe to like, um, we hadn't, we didn't talk about it, but the power of the dog or something like that kind of, you know, they're stylistically very different, but kind of tonally and how the, the story unfolds is very similar. I think at one point, Brad Pitt said that this was his favorite movie that he acted in. Yeah. Which I can kind of see. And I think Roger Deakins too was most proud of, of what he did in this movie, at least the train robbery sequence that he worked on. So yeah, it's it's a very understated movie that nevertheless shows a lot of qualities in the, in a variety of areas, which to me makes it very interesting to watch. Yeah. And there's a lot of different things that the movie does really right, which makes it come together to become more than the sum of its parts. Yes. Even if it was uh, understandably overlooked the first time it came out, when people weren't sure what exactly to make of it. I wanted to say real quick before we move on about the plot, because mm -hmm. you mentioned like missing some details. And I felt kind of the same way after watching it the second time. So I went back and I was reading a plot summary just to make sure I understood everything. And there's some moments in here where I, I can't remember the specific example, but there's at least one moment where there's like a very important piece of plot information that's just kind of slipped like very casually and not very uh, pronounced into the dialogue. And it's just kind of moves past. It's about one of the characters getting shot or the first time you learn like Jesse killed this is jumping ahead a little bit, so apologies. But once Jesse starts getting suspicious that his gang members are after him or trying to get the bounty, basically, he goes to the one guy in that really ratty house and he talks to him. Oh, yeah, at Miller. Yeah. Yeah, one of, one of my notes uh, that I wrote down as I was watching the movie is, what did Ed Miller do? <laughs> Question mark. He ends up getting shot by Jesse James, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And as far as I can surmise, his only sin was was looking and acting extremely suspicious mm. when Jesse came around. Yeah, yeah. And then he does eventually kind of admit that, or he, he kind of leads on that Jim Cummings was out to get Jesse. And then I guess he just gets caught. He just gets killed by association. But what I was going to say is at the end of that scene, so Jesse goes to visit him. Jesse's like, let's go for a ride. And, but then it doesn't show what happens. And then it's like, a while later, Jesse shows up somewhere else and is talking to somebody and just casually mentions that Ed died. And it, like, you could completely miss it. You could like, I almost was like, I need to rewind to see, like, did he actually say that? And then it does confirm it again later when he tells the big story and it actually shows what happened. But there's, there's little things like that all throughout the movie where there's just like a tiny, very important piece of information that just kind of gets slipped into the stream of the delivery of information in a way that you could easily like miss if you, it, it, you know, if you just weren't paying attention or didn't exactly understand the language, which is another thing too. The, the, the way all the dialogue is written is very, this like stylized old West kind of verbiage and vocabulary. And it's easy to overlook details like that. Hmm. Anyway, all this was a complicated hmm. setup for what I wanted to say, which was when I was reading the summary of the plot, one of the things that really stood out to me about this movie is reading the plot and what happens tells you nothing, basically nothing about what the experience of actually watching this movie is like. And it doesn't tell you the mood. It doesn't tell you how it feels. It doesn't tell you what the sort of thematic focuses or uh, what, you know, where the tension lies or the emotions of the character. This is a movie where like almost everything that's really interesting about it is happening in the performances or in the style of how things are presented and not in the actual sort of progression of the plot details, except for maybe the, the, the like final third act where things get a little, you know, interesting that's not to say the plot isn't interesting but just this is definitely one of those movies where like how the movie presents its information and plot what is really what sets this thing apart 
uh, it's not necessarily the like raw contents of the story. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't feel like a movie where the plot is the absolute essence of it, but rather just one of the elements that paints a larger image of what I guess is a good segue into talking about what this movie is actually about. Right, yes, yes. I think the best place to start with that is just at the very beginning with the way uh, that Jesse James is introduced and the way the movie is set up, you know, structurally and stylistically. You mentioned this was your favorite movie when it comes to, or at least when it comes to the uh, work of Roger Deakins, or at least one of his best works uh, as a cinematographer. Yeah, I would rank it pretty high. I would have to, I would yeah. have to look at everything before I would say favorite for sure. But it's up there, top five. Uh, yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Also, specifically because uh, you know he's very much known for making these very pretty images and just beautiful looking shots. But I, I sometimes feel like there's a bit of a divorce between his cinematography and the actual narrative purpose of that cinematography or just the divorce between what the shot looks like and what the story is actually trying to tell. I, you know, there's a few movies that he's worked on that are, I think feel a little bit too pretty for the stories that are actually being told. I think we talk about that in our 1917 yeah. episode, which I think is a bonus episode. So if you mm -hmm. want to hear more about that, check out our, our 1917 bonus episode. And so, yeah, that's why I love this movie so much, at least the cinematography of it, because I feel like this is Roger Deakins working at his most purposeful he just really works in service of the story here. The, you know, the train robbery has this sort of larger-than-life look, which kind of sets up the myth of Jesse James and the sort of myth that Robert Ford is projecting onto this whole lifestyle of these outlaws and of Jesse James specifically. But then after it, he also brings it down to something more natural when we're getting into the reality of it all it becomes more naturalistic and that kind of ties in with the disillusionment that robert ford goes through in the movie yeah yeah and then there's the scenes with the narration which also so sometimes suddenly cut to this different visual style that's a more faded memory-ish look you know like a vignette mm -hmm. and it, it, it just becomes very clear that all that we're watching is is history you know it's memories it's it's a bygone era you know like looking at faded old photographs it's already eroded by time to some extent and if i remember correctly i think that's what the movie also opened on like this faded image of clouds passing by and then specifically also the introduction of jesse james and this was something that i also thought was very interesting is that the movie introduces jesse james not by his actual character but more by the myth that's survived about him yeah you know we get all these little facts from the voiceover jesse james was this jesse james did that and at this time he was that age and so on all the while having these very stylized images of him standing in the field and watching up at the clouds and there's an artificiality to it you don't feel as immediately connected to them as the viewer they feel distant in a way you, you know you're watching a a legend from the past, something that's not actually real. But then when we get to the introduction of Robert Ford, he just kind of walks into the frame. It's f way more naturalistic by, by this yeah. point, as if now, uh, you know, the movie is already undercutting his legend status, um, so to say. You know, he, he, he kind of comes into this story expecting to become part of this whole larger myth or larger legend about the outlaw Jesse James and his adventures. And then slowly he, of course, becomes disillusioned by it all. And I think that's just so beautifully portrayed visually also and just by the whole presentation of it all. You know, the faded, vague look, the narration. It, it, it almost feels like you're being read a bedtime story. Yeah. Which in a way does turn this whole story into a more meta story. Even though the whole story of Robert Ford is one where you go on a journey sort of deconstructing that same story to arrive at something more down to earth. But yeah, I don't know. I, I know some people have criticized the narration for feeling somewhat purposeless because it will often 
narrate what we're also already seeing visually. So it doesn't necessarily convey new information. Yeah. But I I don't agree because I do think it helps to really set that atmosphere that kind of purposefully disengages the viewer a bit from the events that um, unfold within the story and that make you more of a observer of it instead of a participant in it. Yeah. Which I think was the deliberate move uh, on the director's part because I think it does want you to stand on the outside of it and then look back into it uh, from that vantage point and not have you experience the story from the inside of it where you can potentially really get like sucked up into the whole myth and the, the legend of Jesse James. Right. Which I guess makes it more risky yeah. for the audience to end up within the romanticization of Jesse James rather than uh, be part of the deconstruction of it. Because I think that's what the movie really wanted to do. It, it didn't want you to be part of the myth. It doesn't want you to relish in it. It wants you to stand on the outside of it and kind of have this outside perspective on it. And sort of in that way prevent you from making that same mistake that Robert Ford did in the movie. Where the whole tragedy of him is basically the result of him falling in love with this myth, with this story. And then becoming so disillusioned by it that he ends up not just killing Jesse James, but also, uh, in a way, causing his own demise. You know, he's filled with regret and then he ends up being shot himself in the epilogue. You know, that's what I think is the sort of main journey here. I agree about the narration for sure. I think another thing I would say about that is it serves this clear purpose of forming that context of this being kind of a story that you're being told or this legend about the past or it creates that remove. Also, it's very entertaining narration to listen to. It's very well written. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's based on a book. So I, I don't, I haven't read the book. I'm assuming some of the narration is probably ripped straight from the book, hmm. but some of the best uses of narration, you, you know, a lot of times the critiques of voiceover are it's redundant, it's unnecessary or whatever. I think that can often, you know, maybe this is a hot take. Some people might disagree, but I think that can be overcome by just having like actually really good, like literary quality writing as the, as the narration that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't give you a free pass everywhere, but I'm going to be much more forgiving of narration if I'm like, oh, that was the way that information was presented was entertaining to listen to, you know, mm -hmm. even if I can also see what's happening on the screen. But I think, yeah, the, the more relevant defense is, is what you're saying, which is the broader picture that this whole thing is painting. And the arc that that's illustrating with, with Bob, yeah, there's such a, this is a tricky one to talk about because of what is being conveyed, like, like I said, is not necessarily inside what unfolds in the plot. There's a melancholy, there's an obvious melancholy to this film. And I was thinking about where is that coming from yeah. or what is that centering on or what is the melancholy supposed to be about? Is that sort of Bob's at the end of his life looking back on this with regret and kind of wishing he hadn't killed Jesse? There's also Jesse himself who is sort of like tormented by his inner demons. We don't get like a big view into that, but there's a lot of lines where he talks about that. And there's this whole ambiguity with how the story is unfolding as to whether or not maybe he's even kind of offering a hand in his own demise a little bit, I think is, is a big question for me I have about the end. There's the sadness of Bob at the end, mm, yeah. the regret, but there's also the sadness of the of Robert Ford in the middle where he's he's coming to terms with the deconstruction, the falling apart of this this hero that he had and this legend. And then he meets the man and that kind of disintegrates and that childhood romanticism is destroyed. And there's kind of a sadness in that. What do you think were the more precise elements that caused that whole 
image to shatter you know the the reality of jesse james compared to the image that robert ford had of him in his mind there i think it builds up slowly and that in the film there's several events there's a couple times early on where bob catches jesse off guard he kind of like sneaks up on him a little bit unintentionally and that's a first a first big one where he's like oh i thought nobody could catch jesse unaware or yeah, something yeah, yeah. that's kind of the the myth and then from there it kind of proceeds as just interacting with jesse is not exactly what he imagined and then it really starts to take a turn when there's that scene where they're at dinner and jesse is kind of making fun of making fun of bob a little bit that's where it really starts to make a break but one thing I wanted to ask you about, because I, th I think it's interesting, we, it relates to this discussion. There's that scene later in the film, things have started to progress, and Bob and Charlie are kind of, it's the end game. Bob and Charlie are, are worried that Jesse's going to kill them. They're trying to either kill Jesse or arrest him or whatever. And they're talking in the, I think it's in the field. And Charlie's like, you think it's all yarns and newspaper stories, kind of saying like, Jesse is as dangerous as he seems or as is told, like the legends are true. And Bob very matter of factly is like, he's just, he's just another man. He's just a human. He's, there's nothing magical about him. He can be caught off guard. And I wanted to hear your thoughts about this. Cause I think there's this very interesting element there where it almost feels like Bob is the one who's able to kill him over anybody else because he held Jesse in such high regard. He view, he he believed the myth more than anyone else, at least in the crew. And then when that's shattered, it's so profoundly shattered. He's like, oh, Jesse is just a man. Even I could kill him. And that's sort of what gives him the confidence to be like, I'm the, uh, you know, yeah, I could yeah. kill Jesse because he's not this, this thing. Whereas all the other guys seem to still hold on to the, you know, Jesse comes around and they just start like shaking in their boots just because he showed up unannounced, basically. I think that has to do with the fact that beneath the romanticization of Jesse James, the gunslinger legend, beneath there, there is still a dangerous and violent man. Yeah, yeah. He definitely often shows himself to be uh, un unpredictably cruel. You know, like needlessly cruel and unpredictable in his actions, which makes him very frightening for many of the men around him who just don't know what he's going to do at any given moment. Especially knowing that if he does something, he is capable of doing serious violence. You know, he's capable of doing the worst. Yeah. So I feel like for the men who have this more down-to-earth mindset they can kind of strip away the stories about him while still seeing that there is an actually dangerous man there who could do serious harm to them as well as to others yeah and so yeah i i wonder if then maybe in that moment robert ford kind of steps from one delusion into in, into another where first he had this romanticization that is now being undercut but that he in that process also sort of undermines the actual reality is just to see him as completely like a total facade instead of still having, still acknowledging that there still is that, that violent man there. Right. You know, like he, he saw Jesse James as this all powerful being, but when that image was shattered, you know, he now maybe saw him as all joke almost, or, you know, all weakness instead of um, stripping away that legend to see, the actual reality yeah, of who yeah. Jesse James was. So yeah, <laughs> may have been like a case of false confidence there. There's this image of Jesse James that, uh, or I think that's maybe the image that he tried to create for himself at the time, that he was sort of this Robin Hood figure who would steal from the rich and give to the poor. So he was violent and powerful, but he was <laughs> yeah, yeah. in his own way sort of benevolent. And, you know, from the train robbery on, we already see the that this is kind of, um, not true basically that you know he is violent and uh, indiscriminately violent uh, to anyone basically there's also that moment where he slaps around that cousin of Robert Ford you know quite severely so you know he clearly is he is not this Robin Hood type figure yeah. 
he's basically just a thug and a robber and uh there's there's nothing romantic about that which i think also plays into the disillusionment maybe that he's not this great figure of justice but you know he's just a criminal and so i guess this also played into robert ford's motivation in killing uh jesse james because you know he mentions at the end that he uh what he expected was applause you know he he comes to see jesse not just as this hero but more almost as a villain and so he expects that by killing him that then maybe he becomes the hero and you know and be rewarded and be embraced as such you know we know from the beginning on he mentions he wants to do something great in his life he wants to be this heroic figure you know someone who would become the main protagonist in his own story and then maybe comes to feel like oh maybe this is the way to achieve that like maybe this is my destiny and it's almost like he then has his second arc almost like he has two disillusionments where you know he, he first becomes disillusioned about the man jesse james but then also becomes disillusioned from the man robert ford as the great hero yeah. You know, the, as the man who, who killed the bad guy, Jesse James. But then, you know, instead of being met with praise, he's actually met with uh, all this animosity. And, and he's just basically despised and even ends up being killed for it uh, by the end. And there's the fundamental disconnect there of him being called or treated as a coward, which in my estimation, like if, you, if you're watching the first half of the story or before that kind of final third fourth act bit at the end he seems like one of the more courageous of the group like he is kind of unafraid in the face of of jesse while all these other guys kind of seem very terrible we're well, not completely unafraid but he has more courage it seems like than some of the the other guys or he doesn't stick out to me as particularly cowardly i guess that you know there's the element of like he shooting him in the back or from behind, you know, is kind of, I think, why the public then ends up perceiving him as a coward. Yeah, it's, it's not like the kind of showdowns you normally see in Westerns, you know, where you have both of them standing on opposite ends of the street, a uh, hand on the, like, the, the gun on the side, uh, right. that little dry bush that <laughs> flies across the screen. But, I mean, in doing that, he was just, uh, the reality we see that the sort of the public who's m creating the myth the reality we see is that's the kind of guy Jesse was too. Like Jesse would take the guys out on the horse and shoot them in the back. Like there wasn't a Jesse didn't have there. We never see Jesse go in a showdown face to face with somebody. Uh, he uses manipulation and all like intimidation and all these other tactics to kind of maintain his power. And then, you know, he's willing to just off somebody, uh, you know, in the back. So, there, I don't know. There's like a, I find that disconnect too really interesting. The in a power of storytelling. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting to see when a character is either ingrained into a story as either hero or anti-hero or whatever, and then there's the other guy who wants to come in and also be that, but then he does something to upset the narrative, and you then become the villain. That's it's almost like it doesn't really matter what you do, but rather about the way it fits into the existing narrative. This movie kind of, if you wanted to be super reductive and trite, is one of the best versions of just like, never meet your heroes as a movie. <laughs> and I think we've, I have questions here in my notes about fame. And I think we've kind of been talking around that without mentioning it directly. But that's also a big element of this is just the dynamics of fame, sort of that being why Robert Ford is holding Jesse James in such regard, why he ends up being, uh, there's, there's just a lot at play here in regards to fame. You think there's anything there that we haven't really touched on yet in terms of how this might be commenting on kind of fame as a larger theme? Yeah, I... Maybe I, I, I was thinking of the the disconnect between why Jesse is so revered, whereas Bob was so despised. And I think that's maybe also because in the public's perception, and that also comes with fame, I guess, is that Jesse is perceived as this nobody who 
created his own myth from the ground up, whereas Bob it just kind of comes in on the tail end of it and tries to force himself into whatever it was that Jesse had already established. Yeah. Bob here almost uses Jesse James as a sort of stepping stone towards his own fame, towards his own legend. And so I feel like whenever something like that happens, there's in the public's perception, it never, what Bob did, never tr- never feels as earned as doing it yourself from the ground up, you know. There's a lot of misconceptions about myth, but at least whenever there's the perception that someone does something for them, for themselves or creates something themselves, that's always going to be more admired than someone who just uh, catapults from the fame of someone else. Because now Bob is not really his own legend, he's just the bookend of someone else's. You know, he's the guy who killed Jesse James, and so basically he just exist within the Jesse James legend at the very end of it rather than having his own legend that stands on its own. That's maybe something that Robert Ford misunderstood. You know, he thought he would be getting his own legend, but really he was now just being perceived through the myth of Jesse James. And, you know, the movie kind of emphasizes that, that even after Robert died, there would be no eulogy, there would be no songs for Bob, you know. No one wants to take pictures with his corpse. He just kind of fades away into history. Yeah. And the guy who kills Robert just ends up in jail. You know, somewhat I- ironically, the other guy does get a more heroic status. Right. You know, there's this whole, you know, they mention there's this whole petition for his release. Oh, yes. You yeah, know, a yeah. petition that's like signed by thousands of people. <laughs> He's to... pardoned. Yeah. So oh, he weirdly gets more status than Robert Ford does, even though he, he also just walked up to uh, Robert Ford almost in the same way that Robert Ford... Uh, walked up to Jesse James and just shot him without uh, it necessarily being a fair fight or like this, you know, this more traditional showdown. There's so many moments in that that final after Jesse dies, that last epilogue, I guess you would call it, at the end there. And the way the moments are framed in that section, I think it's the first time we start seeing, you mentioned sort of the, the use of the heavily vignetted cinematography through that like vintage lens Mm -hmm. and i think it's in that section is the first time we really start to see i could be wrong about this but it's the first time we really start to see uh robert portrayed through that lens so there's a little bit of like it slips into a different form and there's these Mm. echoes of the story that came before and right before he's shot robert is also looking at this newspaper but instead of there being a story about something related to him, that's this important element like there is in the, the version with Jesse James. It's just like news from that day. And then the guy comes in with the shotgun. It, there's just this the way that whole thing is constructed and then the way it just kind of slides into this like meaningless sort of sadness uh, and ends on that that final line of just like, him looking at the ceiling before he could even find the right words is such a, like the poetry of that, even in his last moments, Robert Ford was denied of sort of becoming a myth because he couldn't even, he couldn't even get out like last words that could somehow become like a part of his story or a part of the myth. He just ends up this sad man killed the way the movie I don't know, is just like continues to give Robert no purchase for actual heroicism or anything like that. Yeah, it's in the title already. And no sympathy. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) right, right. Just kind of brutal in a way that almost makes you like by the end, there's he doesn't really do anything in the movie that besides just be like, I guess, less terrible than literally all these horrible like criminals that are around him. He's just marginally less terrible than them. But by the end, I almost I almost start to feel these like pangs of uh, sympathy for him. I'm like, ah, he like he didn't really deserve this kind of like uh, just complete. I don't know, but I don't know how I feel about feeling that way. Like I'm I'm left unsure what is going on here in terms of sort of what is being said, like fame And sort of this kind of myth is kind of ultimately empty or like pursuing that and basing your life around it in the way that that uh, Robert Ford is, is kind of ultimately empty. 
I don't know. I think that's kind of what it's getting at, maybe. Yeah, I, I think it obviously has to do a lot with the disillusionment about what it really means to be a heroic character, not just within the context of the story, but also within society. Yeah. He does end up in the James Gang because of his desire for great things and for wanting to be like Jesse James, which also kind of becomes his fatal flaw towards the end. You know, there's that, there's that line where Jesse James uh, asks Bob, like, do you want to be like me or do you want to be me? You know, like he's asking Bob if he wants to have his own story if we, or if he just wants to insert himself into his. Right. And I wonder to what extent this, and I was going to ask you this, um, to what extent does this play into a more general American myth? About, you know, maybe the American dream, the self-made man, or just what it means to be the sort of American ideal hero. You know, because outlaws in general have been, it seems at least, uh, received with a lot of respect to some extent in American culture. Yeah. You know, they are these figures that are kind of individualistic. They kind of exist, you know, as the name suggests, out outside of the law. They kind of have their own sense of justice, they make their own way, they build their own lives um, without anyone telling them what to do. You know, just very self-sufficient, very self-made, kind of, you know, libertarian almost, uh, communal maybe in, 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 in the small sense, like in, within the confines of a gang or a very small community. Figures who are not necessarily aggressive, but, you know, capable of aggression, they're, they're protective, capable of standing for what they believe in. So yeah, I was just curious about, you know, is there a relation here between this kind of image of the American myth, you know, or the uh, ideal American hero, that sort of thing? I think it's complicated because there's definitely a valorization, like you're saying, of the criminal, but it's always conflicted in a sense. I was thinking about the way it ends, you... You start to see, because in the first part of the movie, you're just, it doesn't give you the cultural context, really. I mean, you see the little books that, you know, the the books that Robert is reading. So you have this sense of, oh, you know, and it tells you in voiceover that Jesse James is famous. And we know the, sort of the myth that exists of the of the the actual Jesse James. You have some of that context there, but you don't actually see it in the movie until the end where you see people singing songs about Jesse James and everybody crowding around the, the dead body and all of this stuff. And I was watching that and I was thinking like, do we do that? You know, that's kind of, seems kind of like barbaric, but we do, we do kind of still do that in our culture as, in America. Like one of the most popular shows of the last couple decades, or a lot of the most popular shows of the last couple decades are things like The Sopranos or... Uh, Breaking Bad, where it's about these criminal men. And those shows aren't uncritical of their characters. They come with this sort of, there's a critique or an acknowledgement of what's bad about them. But there's also an element of that that is sort of undeniably sort of intrigued by that criminal element. I think your analysis is pretty good in that it is, what it ultimately is, is about sort of like that character's individuality and and just the way in which they they don't care what what they don't care about the law they just go do their thing and that they're rebellious yeah and the sort of quote-unquote american spirit if you could even call it that like the or the culture just like can't help but sort of be enamored in those by those kinds of people however in whatever form they exist i think it, because there's there's a really interesting line in there too where towards the beginning of the film, it says something about, there's some comment about people saying like, Missouri is the only state that would tolerate like this many bank robberies. Oh yeah. Uh, like he would have gotten killed or whatever in any other state. And it's like, that's also a very American thing. It's like, we're going to love Jesse. Yeah, it's like Jesse James, he's so great. And then it's like, if that was in any other state, he would have been shot dead at the first bank robbery. It's like, but like, I think that same attitude is also venerating the same thing. It's like, well, my sheriff, the sheriff of my state or the government, he's such a, an aggressive, you know, 
fighter or you know what you know a, we would have caught him by now for sure and that's the west that's the mythos of the west is like it's all oriented around independence yeah whoever's yeah. ability very anti-government sentiments at least compared to Europe, where we have a much more stronger sense of, you know, it's been waning a little bit, but compared to the United States, there's a much stronger acceptance of the government, or at least, uh, or at least the, the the sort of social structure that it represents. Whereas I feel like in the in the United States, there's a much stronger wariness to anything government related. Yeah, at least on you know the federal level. Even if it's ultimately to the benefit of the people, you know, it seems, you know, you know things like healthcare, uh, public transport, that sort of stuff. Right. You know, to me, it always feels like Americans would rather be miserable in freedom than <laughs> be happy in a more collective state. Right. <laughs> now that we're talking about this, I'm kind of seeing that I think that plays an element, too, in the whole perception of Robert Ford as a character as a coward at the end. It's not about what he did. It's about how he did it. And if if Ford had come out into the streets and they had had a shoot off and he had managed to kill Jesse, everybody would have been like, well, he was a better, you know, he was a better shot than Jesse. So I guess Jesse deserved to die. That is that same kind of that same impulse of like, well, you know, the may the best man win is kind of the and if the best man just so happens to be like better than the government in this case, you know, well, then what are we going to do? You know, there's nothing we can do about it. We just have to hold that guy up as our hero or whatever. I don't know. I'm, I'm riffing here. So you don't don't hold me. Don't hold me to any of this analysis. But yeah, it, it feels like that thing where you admire the man who builds his own fortune, but then he gives that fortune to his son. But then nobody likes that guy because right. he, yes. because they feel like he didn't yeah. earn yeah. it. It's a good question, though, because this story is very much, I think, not just a, like a deconstruction of myth or fame or something like that. But within the context of it being a Western, it's very much a deconstruction of Westerns. It's resistant to a lot of the tropes of Westerns. I think about that scene where <laughs> one of the characters comes in, they find out Dick Little has slept with the sister of the guy played by Jeremy Renner. And Jeremy Renner comes in and there's this shoot off. Oh, yeah. And instead of it being like this exciting shoot off in the style you would normally see in a Western, he just bursts through the door and they just like unload their guns at each other and nobody hits anybody or like they're, they're such terrible shots and they can't they can't kill each other. The one and They're like right up in each other. Too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The one guy's like falling out the window. It's almost comedic, like the way it plays out. And then Robert is the one who kind of ends it all with this one shot. He's the, he's, I guess the best shot of any of them, but it, it just ends so anticlimactically. And then they can't even like the guy just lays there like dying. And the woman comes up and is like, Oh, well, you know, too bad you had to die or whatever. It, like the, the comedy of that scene is such a antithesis of, I think, like how Westerns usually would structure a moment like that. And that's kind of fun. But also like the original Western is so ingrained with kind of like a certain type of mythos of it's an original like American myth in a sense or not ori not original original to the colonizing, the, the colonizing force in America. It's the central, it's maybe the central myth of, or one of the central myths of that like portion of culture. Yeah, I think it's also very much a myth for conservatists too, I think, you know, because these outlaw stories usually tend to revolve around, you, you know, you have the Wild West and there's the progress that's coming from the East. Yes. You know, the the future is the East, the West is the old, and the the new is coming to take the old. And then the outlaws become like these last men standing, you know, the, the, the last protectors of this old way of living. And so, yeah, I, I can imagine they're being revered maybe even more like today uh, as kind of these protectors by modern day conservatists. Yeah, there's, there's such a, I don't know, I, it's something I would have, I haven't, delved into sort of like westerns in cinema and this 
narratives there and yeah no for some reason i i was also thinking of red dead redemption the game especially the second part which is set slightly later than most westerns are and therefore also really you know it's also really about this almost existential issue where the west or the west is uh, disappearing in the wake of uh uh, the rise of modernity, the rise of the East that's taking everything over. Yeah, yeah. You know, almost like this battle royale where the world around them is just shrinking in, becoming increasingly smaller. So yeah, I, I wonder if that's a more revisionist take on the Western, where we where we now really look at the Western as this kind of last remnant of a certain way of living that is now yeah. perceived to be at least uh, lost. That kind of independent... Uh, libertarian-esque uh, type of living uh, where every man creates their own myth and which is now being basically overtaken by the United States as we uh, know it today. You know, the more federal collectivist system. Yeah, the show Deadwood also is a really heavily delves into all of that, that exact kind of story framework. It's about like this one town and the libertarian element being this kind of anarchist town having civilization sort of quote unquote imposed on it from outside and how that is changing things and sort of how that's like a death of this certain existence or something like that. The Westerns are, are, are a fascinating genre, both the old ones and the new ones, because so much of so many of the themes that they deal with are, are like we're saying, kind of very connected to, sort of the formation of modern America and what it looks like or the the sort of impulses that drove its history and that kind of thing or the United States at least. Oh yes, yes. Okay, this is the question I feel like that we haven't dealt with that I'm curious about yet, which is Jesse James, in your opinion, is he orchestrating his own death at the oh, end yeah. this is left pretty ambiguous yeah i love the way that scene is shot you know the, the there's an absurdity to the whole setup where you can feel there's something off like everyone in the room knows what's going to happen but they still have to enact it or something yes which is kind of echoed later on by robert ford doing all these theater plays in which he plays it out uh, over and over again but yeah, I, I just love the way that Jesse steps up on that stool and uh, looks into the frame and there's the reflection of um, Robert lifting his gun and you can see Jesse just kind of quietly bobbing his head down a little bit. And, you know, then that's it. You know, like a, like, like this brief moment of acceptance of, you know, like he's at peace with what was going to happen. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not sure what the actual accounts of his assassination are based on. I'm guessing it's on what the brothers have, uh, you know, Robert Ford himself has said about it. But I'm, I'm. I'm not sure to what extent they are contested, like historically. It's just the whole setup with the oh, that picture looks dusty. It just let me just step up and look at it. Or, right, right. It's kind of. It, it, it feels deliberate yeah. in a way that makes it. You know, it, it, it just shows intentionality on Jesse's part, but it's it's not exactly sure what that intentionality was. Right. I have no idea in the real case, or I don't, I, I'm not even sure really how closely this, this film relates to the actual story, but... I think that in the uh, IMDb trivia, at least, it says that the descendants of Desi- Jesse James said that this movie was the most accurate when it comes to portraying his story. Okay, interesting, yeah. So I guess there's that. There's also all these little sort of moments leading up to that final run up to the insa- assassination. There's a scene where Jesse is out with Charlie and he, Jesse's asking Charlie if he's ever contemplated suicide, basically. Jesse has been like talking about him being a problem for himself and like basically not wanting to live with himself there's the whole scene where jesse says you're gonna break a lot of hearts and bob says how so jesse doesn't answer the question he just gives him the gun that bob then shoots jesse with which is like they never answer that question but that question is is 
answered by the film later because Bob broke the hearts of all these people who who had held Jesse up. So there, there, it feels like to me there's a there's a movement towards the end of Jesse kind of knowing what's happening and wanting to die and sort of orchestrating it happening in a certain way, which is a little bit ambiguous, but I'm left wondering if also that's kind of like even maybe Robert's own myth-making in his memory of like, there's a kind of myth-making in there that seems to ultimately run antithetical to almost what the rest of the movie is doing, I I feel like, where it is like, if that's all true, then it's sort of re-elevating Jesse James back up to this status of myth Mm -hmm. where it's like, he was so powerful that really the the only reason he was killed by Robert is because he sort of like wanted to die and allowed it to happen. Yeah, because he, he led him. He led him, you know, and maybe there's sort of a kind of biblical theme running in there where there's a little bit of like, you know, uh, I'm going to let Judas sort of take, betray me or whatever. Mm, yeah. Um, I don't know. That's probably like a really... I think it's way too easy to overread the <laughs> the story of Christ into a lot of um yeah yeah like modern films uh, and I think I'm wary of people who like to do that too much um but I don't know if there's maybe that reflection here to some extent I think it may have just been the fact that he you know Jesse had been very paranoid or at least increasingly paranoid throughout the movie it's like he was bearing the stress of knowing it was going to happen eventually. Right. Like all the original members of his gang were already dead or gone. And, you know, he's now surrounded by these new guys who he doesn't trust and who he starts to or, or comes to realize that may might want to put a bullet in his head. And so, you know, he, he just feels like his days are over and now he's just right. constantly waiting for someone to do the actual deed you know and so that's maybe why he figures you know i'm just gonna give them the the out you know i'm gonna give them the setup um i'm gonna give them the opportunity and that way i can relieve myself of that stress yeah yeah you know even before you know before he steps up to that frame there's that moment where he takes off his belt and he puts it like neatly onto the couch and he disarms himself he puts his back towards uh bob and his brother he makes it as clear as possible that he's not going to do anything, that he's now in this phone roll position. And, you know, and, you know, if you're going to take the shot, you know, do it now. Well, thank you all for listening. If you enjoy the show and want to help us keep it going, be sure to follow us on our creator-owned streaming service, Nebula. Cinema of Meaning is a Nebula original show, meaning that here you can experience our podcast ad-free, listen to all of our episodes a week early, and get instant access to all of our monthly bonus episodes. This month, that'll be David Fincher's Fight Club, but before that we've also covered Avatar The Way of Water, The New All Quiet on the Western Front, Upstream Color, Alien Covenant, Drive, and many, many others. So you're basically getting a whole new catalog of episodes. You can sign up directly at our Nebula page, that's nebula.tv slash cinemaofmeaning, or just follow the link in the show notes. And we'll see you again next time.